I'd like to just get a little bit better understanding of North Korea and its leader, um, Kim Jong-un. We, we tend to get somewhat of a caricatured picture here in the United States of North Korea. So I'd like to start with Professor Kong. Can you give us a little bit more of a nuanced view yeah. of, of North Korea today and, and of its current leader? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest problems we have in the United States with viewing North Korea is that we make a joke out of the leader. So there's a movie about the interview, or it's fun to call him fat or chubby. But that doesn't help us understand what's going on, because he's not a joke. And so treating him like a joke makes the problem not nearly as serious as it is. This is a rule. He's the third uh, generation of the Kim family. His grandfather founded the country. His uh, father ran it for a long time. And he took power below when he was younger than uh, 30 years old in 2012. And the thing is that everybody thought he couldn't survive, that he was going to be a playboy and he wasn't going to be serious. But we're going on six years, and it's very clear he knows how to rule. And so in some ways, you know, the questions about whether he's crazy or whether he's, he's a, a, a joke are missing the point. He clearly knows what he's doing. He clearly has a plan for North Korea. It's called the Byungjin Line, which is nuclear weapons and economic development. And so, you know, in some ways, we need to take him a little more seriously because he's clearly shown he can make calculations about uh, uh, how to rule, how to play internal politics, and uh, how to play uh, internationally. This is, this is a real leader that we need to take seriously. So we also have a relatively new administration in the United States. Um, can you, I'm sticking with you just for another minute, um, what do you take away from President Trump's recent trip to Asia, and what does this tell us about his administration's approach um, and our relationship specifically with North Korea? I actually think that trip was really important. Uh, President Trump, particularly on the, on the Japan and Korea side where he's talking about North Korea, uh, he hit all the right notes, and I can see the sort of fingerprints of some people I know in D.C., and I'm sure the general knows this, right, of sort of trying to, how we make sense. Every administration comes in uh, and has to take a while to figure out what they're doing. Uh, the Trump administration isn't as staffed up as quickly as we'd like. But in general, the, the, the message that I hear from President Trump, uh, even though it's a little more flamboyant than perhaps others, uh, remains a deterrent message, meaning when he says, if you attack us first, we will fight back, which is what every American president has said since I can remember. So in a way, I thought that was actually a very successful trip. And uh, he, he managed uh, to, uh, he, you know, he managed the relationship and he managed to get to North Korea exactly what I think uh, many of us were hoping that he would say. Interesting. Um, so General Petraeus, let me bring you in here. Do you agree with this assessment? Um, and can you give us some context for how you place this approach relative to the approaches of our recent administrations? Yeah, I think I generally would agree with David on that. Um, I think the trip, most importantly, in a sense, stayed on script. <clears throat> that has been interesting at times uh, in the first year of the administration, of course. Uh, I think it was distinguished by uh, a degree of softening, frankly, of the rhetoric on China in particular. Uh, there is very clearly a, a perception on the U.S. side at the, at the least uh, that uh, President Xi is someone with whom we can deal, uh, that he is someone who played to the, uh, the senses of a U.S. president who does enjoy, as he has personally acknowledged, uh, pageantry and uh, being treated well and so forth, and he certainly was. Uh, it, <clears throat> given though the very tough rhetoric about China, certainly during the campaign and then uh, even subsequently until finally he made the phone call, uh, President Trump made the phone call to President Xi, embraced the one China policy, invited him to Mar-a-Lago, had the Mar-a-Lago summit, and then obviously now has been uh, to Beijing and they've started these four working groups and so forth. Um, I don't know that you can hold out uh, and again, still early days, still the first 10 months of the administration, but I, I don't know that you can hold out concrete achievements on the issues that uh, the president made uh, very strongly uh, during the campaign uh, on trade, on the closing out of certain sectors to the U.S., uh, on uh, 
taking a stronger uh, stance against North Korea. We'll see on that. I think that's actually what th this really is all about. And I'll put this in context, I think, for the United States in a second here. Uh, concerns over aggressive activities in the East and South China Sea, um, very aggressive uh, use of cyberspace to uh, steal intellectual property. Uh, these are all issues that have been tangentially addressed, but I don't think there's been concrete and substantive achievement yet. We'll see. Uh, again, the working uh, groups that have been established, uh, at least two of those four have met. Uh, they're moving along. Really, I think, though, the relationship has come down to what will China do about North Korea. Uh, and this is a China now, it's really a President Xi, because he is China now. He has consolidated power in a way that no one since Mao uh, has. His thought has been enshrined in the Constitution uh, in a way that no one else's but Mao's was. Uh, Deng Xiaoping had to wait until he died for that to happen. Um, and it's a complete change over the way China has been ruled in the past, which was a good bit more consensual, in part to avoid the kind of concentration of power that Mao had when they embarked uh, on uh, the Cultural Revolution, which was so ruinous, uh, and all recognize that, I think, in the leadership ranks now. Uh, but given the 19th Party Congress, uh, where President Xi held forth for some three and a half hours uh, with his uh, description and his analysis and his uh, discussion of the objectives of the future, uh, very clear that he is in, a, in the strongest position, again, of any uh, party leader since Mao. Uh, it's very clear where he intends to take China, which is to be a true global leader. Uh, they're not hiding their light under a bushel anymore the way they did in the past with a degree of both focus on domestic and, and try to be modest and alarm the neighbors. Um, so he has a degree of power now that should be translatable into an ability to uh, tighten the umbilical cord between China and North Korea, uh, through which 90% of the trade to and from the Hermit Kingdom goes. So uh, that is, I think, what we're all waiting to see now. That will be, that's the focus of the relationship. There will be further trade cases. Some have already been taken. Uh, there will certainly be further of those, but really the relationship right now is, is really centered around China uh, creating sufficient pressure on North Korea uh, that it stops the missile testing. And I might note that there was a ballistic missile tested today, uh, apparently. And the nuclear testing programs that accelerated so dramatically uh, during the first year of the Trump administration. Uh, to put this into context for, uh, in United States terms, I think you do have to be fair to the current administration and acknowledge that it faces a different prospect from any of its predecessor uh, administrations. Uh, and that is that on this president's watch, uh, in his first term, North Korea could have an ability to strike a US city, perhaps in the western part of the United States, uh, with a nuclear weapon. In other words, an intercontinental ballistic missile with a miniaturized warhead that can actually survive the reentry uh, and again, uh, uh, cause extraordinary damage uh, to the target. That is different, again, than any other uh, of President Trump's predecessors. Um, and I think it is understandable in, in view of that, that there should be such a focus on this issue uh, for the US national security team. You can mention, as I think David alluded to, that you know some of the message discipline at times has uh, perhaps been a bit lacking. Um, but by and large, the, the rattling of the saber, all of these discussions of military options and all the rest of that, uh, this is not aimed at, at Kim Jong-un. I don't think people think that they can influence him. This is aimed at President Xi and China uh, and getting China to do more uh, to bring a halt to the testing and bring Kim Jong-un to the table. Uh, from which it's, we'll have to see where that would go, but that would be an awfully good start. Uh, noting, I think you have to be measured in your uh, objectives and not get too carried away with thinking that we could actually denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. One other aspect of this that I think does uh, bear discussion is 
we, we really have got to explain to China uh, and make sure it's aware that the strategic ramifications uh, of it not bringing North Korea to halt the testing uh, could be very dramatic. Uh, at what point, for example, does North Korea not just get longer range missiles of its own, which it is now developing, or I'm sorry, South Korea, get longer range missiles? Remember, there was a cap to those that they agreed with the United States, which would have lifted. Uh, at what point does South Korea say we want nuclear weapons back in the Korean Peninsula for them, uh, for their side? Um, what, at what point do they actually embark on their own program uh, of nuclear weapon development? Uh, what about Japan, which actually could do this very easily, has extraordinary uh, expertise in uh, nuclear energy and technology, uh, and therefore would have quite a, a head start if they wanted to head down that road? At what point, you know, China didn't like the THAAD system, this terminal high altitude air defense system that went in uh, to South Korea, if they don't like that, they're really not going to like when you multiply that times three or four more uh, and then put in other layered defenses and start parking Aegis cruisers uh, uh, in that location and all the rest. And Japan then gets Aegis ashore, gets its own THAAD and other systems. Uh, and then when does South Vietnam say that, well, maybe we should have uh, air defenses and a nuclear program of our own as well? Uh, these are not not beyond uh, the real potential or real possibility here. These aren't unrealistic, I don't think. And so, again, the sooner that China can realize what this could ultimately lead to uh, in its neighborhood, um, with neighbors, many of whom have maritime disputes uh, with uh, the China, I think is the better, uh, because otherwise this will continue to evolve in a way that will be destabilizing uh, in a strategic sense regionally as well. Um, beyond that, let me also just mention that, you know, some of the rhetoric uh, of the administration is um, from somebody who truly does believe what he wrote in his book, The Art of the Deal, which is that the way you negotiate with somebody is you punch the other guy in the nose before you even sit down at the table, and you keep the individual off balance. Um, this is, you know, for those who have studied international relations and deterrence theory and issues of stability, uh, strategic and crisis, um, this is, again, something that has been t called at times the madman theory. Uh, and uh, as Henry Kissinger described at one point, he went to the Soviet Union and sat down with the Soviet leaders and said, you know, Nixon's under a lot of pressure in the White House, and, you know, he has a drink at night sometimes, and, you know, don't push him too far. Now, this is a way that you actually do keep it, another country might be more reluctant to get into a crisis with you. They're not going to push you too far for fear that, again, the, uh, the other side would do something untoward. The problem with that concept is that if you do get into a crisis, even inadvertently, all of a sudden, the last thing you want is for the other side to think that you are, are a madman uh, because they'll think you've already taken the slack out of the trigger. And so you now have a situation that can be termed as crisis instability uh, rather than stability. And, and that has to be recognized by those who are in the positions where you're actually doing this strategic signaling or strategic communications. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, staying with this uh, rhetoric question just for a minute, I wanna come back to Professor Kong and ask, you know, when you're playing that game um, where you punch someone in the nose and then see what happens, um, or, or push the rhetoric a little bit. Rhetorically speaking. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Um, yeah. It, it part of, a big piece of this depends on your understanding of the other yeah. individual. Um, can you give us a little bit of a sense of how um, Kim Jong Un is likely to respond, or how he has been responding, and and what that means, and what we should expect? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, one thing to to pick up on General Petraeus just on that. I think it's it's interesting uh, that we've been worried about the rise of China, but really the rise of China hasn't caused a lot of uh, military response in the region. But the smallest country, North Korea, is actually getting Japan and South Korea to re rethink their military commitment. I mean, it's very interesting that it's not the biggest country that's causing the instability. It's the smallest country. Um, 
and I think that's something we need to think of when we, when we start understanding the region, right? On this itself, one thing that North Korea does, and they do this consistently, again, they're a little flamboyant too, right? But they are consistently making a deterrent statement to us, and we always miss this, which is overwhelmingly they say, uh, we will strike you back, but we miss the first part, which is if you attack us first, comma, we will hit you back. They are both essentially saying, North Korea and the United States are both essentially saying deterrent messages. Most of the media only reports the second one because again, it's sea of fire, it's, you know, it's very flamboyant kind of stuff. But Kim Jong-un directly has responded. They are in dialogue with um, uh, Trump. And when Trump made some statements in August, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un then actually made an unprecedented speech where he responded directly. So in many ways, uh, they are saying, we will fight back if we're punched. And one of the things, I'd, I'd be interested what the generals or what you guys think, but like, there's, there's talk about could, could the United States get away with a surgical strike? Take out 10 targets, tell North Korea that's all we're gonna do, don't do any more. Uh, everything I know about North Korea is that if we hit them, they will hit us back. And that, that that is where we get to the crisis instability. And they are telling us repeatedly that they will hit us back if we attack them. Um, and that everything I know about North Korea is they're very consistent on that on that uh, point. So we can be we can we can threaten a little bit, but I think we start to go down a, a, a very dangerous path if we if somebody starts shooting at each other. Let me bu build on that actually, because you know you often get the question: um, so is a limited option possible? Well, sure, it's possible. I mean, it's conceivable. <laughs> I don't know though that it stays limited, yeah. and that's the yes. challenge. Yes. And by the way, keep in mind, it's not just the United States unilaterally deciding to do this. We've got a very key ally here, and that's South Korea. Uh, and if you're the president of South Korea, are you really going to give thumbs up for a limited option if in, there's a response, a miscalculation, it doesn't stay limited, and of course Seoul, which is now basically 20 million people, depending on where you draw the circle, because it's grown so vastly. And a lot of that growth, I've, I've really watched that during the course of my military career, kept creeping you know, further and further uh, north towards the demilitarized zone, as well as out. Uh, and that's been part just because that's where the land was. So that there are portions of that city, the greater Seoul area, uh, that are within range of thousands of artillery rounds, rock, tens of thousands most likely, rockets, missiles, uh, not to mention perhaps some kind of manned aircraft. And keep in mind, we're not just talking potentially about nuclear weapons, we're talking about biological and chemical weapons, which uh, North Korea is, is believed to have as well. So, you know, you really want to take that risk. Uh, it's easy for planners to develop what seems to be uh, a menu of limited strike options. And certainly South Korea has responded uh, when their ship was sunk, when there had been uh, shelling of the island and so forth. They have responded. Uh, but that has been in a, in a way that I think very clearly was in response to a provocative North Korean action and not something straight across the demilitarized zone. So it sounds like you're both saying that um, military options, limited or not, are likely to get us into an es a, a continued escalation. So let me just—I I don't know about likely. It's just it is possible, and you don't know. You know, people want you That's to assign right. a I, I percentage you're, you're to this. Likely. This yeah. is just—you—you um, you just don't know. Um, again, the question would be at the table: Will this limited quote limited strike? Uh, remain limited right. what would the response be it's really really hard to say so so let's talk a little bit about the response that has been happening we we see an escalation of sanctions rather than military action um i'm going to come back to professor kong for a minute what what do you think about the current round of sanctions imposed last week and how does that compare to the previous rounds yeah, and sure and where are we there's there's two things about sanctions and one is uh will it get north korea to change their behavior which I'm fairly doubtful of. But the second one is, can it, can it restrict their ability to actually break out, so to speak, right? And I think there's more hope on the second uh, uh, impact of, the, um, of sanctions than the first. I mean, you know, there, there's a sort of endless debate in, uh, among those of us who study North Korea about whether these sanctions have been enough and we just haven't tried harder. I tend to be very skeptical. I mean, this is a country that lived through a famine that killed almost a million people. 
uh, that was far more isolated before than it is now. Uh, we can squeeze it now, and there, there's always the argument that, well, you never know, this time might be different. But I don't see this as a country for whom sanctions are going to cause it to back down. In fact, they, again, they proudly say, we, you know, we're going we're to endure this. But can it interdict or can it in some ways hopefully isolate North Korea in a way that uh, it will keep it from getting as many components for its uh, nuclear programs and things? And I think that's where they're trying to get secondary sanctions on banks to try and get them to stop in, uh, dealing with North Korea uh, so that countries are now beginning to pull out of uh, sort of illicitly dealing with North Korea. So I think they can have an effect. Fundamentally, I don't think economic sanctions are going to get North Korea to, to back down, though. Um, I think in some ways what that does is that gets them to double down. But uh, this time might be different. What do, you, what do you think? Well, I'm a little bit more optimistic. positive or optimistic about that. I do think there's a track hit record where this was done before, and that's what got them back to the table. These are much more significant. Of course, they haven't been implemented yet. So again, we haven't, we've only done one case of a secondary sanction, and that was a modest-sized bank in China. So this is a case where you tell the banks in China, you have a choice. You can do business with the number one economy in the world, or you can do business with the hermit kingdom, but you're not going to do business with both, your, your, your decision. This is a big deal uh, if we implement that, uh, but I think that will be coming. Um, the UN Security Council sanctions, again, not yet fully enforced at all. If those are actually enforced by China in particular, through which, as I mentioned, 90% of the trade flows, uh, that would be a very big deal. China could literally turn the lights out in Pyongyang if it wants to. Uh, it will not probably because it wants to try to calibrate this so that they bring Kim Jong Un, as they say, to his knees, but not to his or to his senses, but not to his knees. Uh, they don't want. Uh, North Korea to collapse. Uh, their three red lines, in fact, are no hostile power uh, in Pyongyang, no reunification of the Korean Peninsula, and no wave of refugees across the Yalu River uh, into China, where, by the way, to prevent that, they now have two mechanized divisions, mechanized infantry divisions, and a special operations brigade. So, um, but again, I think this can happen, and I think, as always, you don't have just a single factor policy you have a comprehensive approach. Part of the comprehensive approach uh, is getting countries to close their North Korean embassies because it's through those embassies that they have run these front companies uh, that have been providing revenue, uh, illicit goods, uh, uh, sale of arms, and all the other uh, facilitation of a network that is hugely impressive when you think about how most folks are raised inside North Korea, as is the ability that they have in cyberspace. Uh, again, what a, a years, decades of investment in people, uh, in infrastructure, uh, in front companies and all the rest. Again, largely working out of embassy platforms uh, in a number of countries around the world. And so getting those closed is a real step forward. Um, when I was director of the CIA, it's all publicly known that we obviously were working very hard to try to identify and then shut down front companies and various activities. And it was astonishing to us at times uh, how much they were actually able to facilitate and to do. Uh, in a, uh, addicted, for example, a shipment of luxury vehicles one time, nearly a hundred of them. So again, you know, it's all well and good for Kim Jong-un to say, you know, well, we'll eat grass before we'll submit. Well, I can assure you he won't be eating grass, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and he certainly has not been eating grass lately uh, based on the latest photographs. So, um, but I, again, think that a really comprehensive approach here uh, could bring enough pressure. I don't think it brings pressure sufficient to denuclearize. I mean, I think he's learned the lesson of Gaddafi, of Saddam, of Ukraine, uh, not to give up your nuclear weapons just based on what happened to those three countries when they did. Um, but I do think you could stop the program where it is. You could halt the missile and nuclear testing. And that might be enough, I think, uh, to wind this tension down uh, and, and then you just see where you go from there. Uh, I think we have to be careful, as I mentioned earlier, though, to be realistic in our stated objectives so that we don't uh, get something out there that is just not achievable. That's never a good idea for your declaratory policy. 
So I want to bring you back in on the sanctions thing in just okay. a second, but I just wanted to respond mm -hmm. to something you said because I wanted to ask this earlier. Um, where are we exactly in their, in their nuclear capabilities? And if you say halt where we are, where would that leave us? Well, they clearly have uh, a high yield uh, nuclear capability because the, one of the explosions most recently was I think over 10 times or 12 times the size of the uh, Hiroshima uh, bomb. So whether this is a thermonuclear or some kind of boosted uh, weapon is not entirely clear. Maybe get, uh, maybe tell these folks who don't know the details between those two a little well, bit I mean, about the, that. Well, I mean, the key thing is they've blown up a very, very big uh, nuclear device, and that is very significant. Now, I'm not saying that what was dropped on Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki was small, but uh, 200 kilotons is a heck of a lot bigger than the 10 or 12 or whatever that particular bomb's size was. So that's a very rapid and significant jump just in sheer destructive power. Uh, beyond that, it, is, it appears that there is an intercontinental ballistic missile capability not yet fully proven, nor is there a fully proven ability to miniaturize a warhead uh, that can survive re-entry into the atmosphere. So there's still elements of this uh, that are not demonstrably proven, although there are uh, fears, concerns that these capabilities do exist, they just haven't been uh, fully tested. Um, so, uh, and this is quite a significant and, and rapid uh, development from just a few years ago, for example, when I was the director of the CIA, where it was way short of where we are now. I think that, that there has been an acceleration to the program uh, that was not forecast. So when you say stop where we are now, um, what, what would we prevent them from doing if we stopped where we are now? I mean, are you talking about uh, not, not them, being able to actually reach San Francisco? Yeah, yeah, and, and prevent them from having a proven capability to that, one in which they could be absolutely confident and certain. You know, if you haven't actually done something, it's all well and good to have it in the background, but you're not going to ever use something Right. for fear of what will come in return. It, it, you know, you'd think that normal deterrence would work anyway. By the way, that's something perhaps we should have addressed earlier. One of the huge analytical questions that is out there uh, is essentially, is Kim Jong-un deterrable? Uh, and that all centers on the question of whether or not um, he is suicidal, essentially, or not. And the analysis, and this is publicly known as well, uh, for a number of years in the intelligence community has been that he is not suicidal. Uh, now, you are, you know, how, what's your level of confidence and all the rest of this, these various terms uh, in that community. Uh, but that is, has been, again, affirmed uh, recently uh, once again. So. What, what do you think? Is he deterrable? Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is one of the things I say. I totally agree, right? Like, one thing about the Kim Jong-un uh, administration or the family, it's all about this life. It's not about the afterlife, right? They want to survive. Yeah. Um, this is about now. And this is, it, it's, it's funny, because you know, I've done some stuff in DC and we, we talk about this a lot, but like ever since I've been a kid, they have talked about the possibility of a second Korean War. There's this worry and blah, blah, blah. And at every stage, though, yes, there, there has been a lot from the Axe 76 incident. You know, there was an Axe murder in the, in the DMZ, similar to sort of what happened uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, but at every point, small skirmishes have not become the next war, precisely because the North Korean regime realizes that if they start a second Korean War, they're going to lose. And that's the end of the regime. And so they have an awful lot to lose. And one of the reasons that we don't attack is, again, that it's very clear that our side has a lot to lose. So deterrence, in many ways, is very straightforward here because both sides, if we go down that path, I'm sure they're gaming this in Pyongyang right now and saying if we do, you know, there's two choices. There's sort of this, there's fish shaking, or the end game is ugly for everyone, but particularly ugly for us. And so I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite sure that if we don't start a war, uh, North Korea is not going to start it first. That doesn't mean they won't do dangerous things, but actually starting a war, I think they can be deterred. So, you so know, what, let me oh, just point out, by the way, that uh, every U.S. administration since Nixon, so all the way back, way before North Korea had remotely the capabilities it has now, considered the use of force 
uh, substantial use of force against North Korea, or even some limited packages, uh, in response to some of the provocative actions that North Korea has taken, the tree chopping incident, yeah. for example, being one of those. And inevitably, even again, all the way back to the Nixon administration, uh, the U.S. has not ended up having a significant kinetic response. We may go into the DMZ in force and chop the tree down, which was being trimmed and where the U.S. major was killed by North Korean guards. Uh, we may fly B-52s or B-1s or other aircraft uh, along the borders we've done recently as well. We may mass aircraft carriers, a variety of different shows of force and capability, but not actual use of force. Uh, and again, every single administration has had some crisis uh, where this was the discussion at the Situation Room table. And inevitably, again, there's been a decision to, you know, essentially go sit under a tree until the thought passes <laughs> and, and to do something uh, symbolic, but not as kinetic. So, so speaking of which, there was a launch just uh, today. Um, what do you both think the response will be, and what do you think the response should be from the United States? Well, what you're going to hear, I think, is enormous pressure to implement the sanctions that are on the books. There may be some additional... We have, for example, in the United States, certain authorities, and in fact, restoring North Korea to the uh, that elite group of countries that are state sponsors of terror, which puts them in league with Iran, uh, Sudan, um, and one other country. It may, I don't, what is it? Maybe Syria. Uh, but again, so it's now the fourth. It was on the list before and taken off. Um, that actually gives you additional authorities. So you can argue we already had those in various ways. But Treasury will now, I think, probably ramp up further sanctions and this may be where you do a secondary sanction against a significant bank and really force them to, to make a choice. Yeah. What do you think? No, I think that's, you know, it, I think you know, we'll see about the sanctions, right? I mean, and they do. They're barely getting started. We'll see whether China is willing to push as hard as I think many in the United States want it to push. Um, there's not a kinetic response, right? I mean, you know, as, as long as there remains threats and tests, I think it's very hard for an American president to then say, we will use a military response to a, a missile test. So there will be a lot of discussion where we, where we have been. I mean, in many ways, these follow a cycle. We've actually backed out of this cycle. This cycle went on longer than I expected it to, you know. Uh, but there's a cycle of threats, response, tension, and then we find a way to back down, and then we go back up. And we're sort of, we had sort of come down, and I think we're going to go back up in a, in a degree. You know, one of the challenges, I think, and actually I'd be interested because you're the real student uh, of this, but the way that Kim Jong-un has so, frankly, brutally consolidated his own power. I mean, this is an individual who sent people out with, you know, nerve agent to kill his half-brother, uh, his uncle, his supposed sort of regent mentor. Uh, he had, he gunned him down with a uh, an anti-aircraft uh, weapon, as I recall. So a number of the other powers around him um, have been killed or sidelined. I think it has to be very difficult right now to find someone who can actually speak for Kim Jong-un diplomatically. I mean, this has never been easy. Yeah. This has always been difficult. Uh, there have always been some activities behind the scenes, though, and, and it's publicly known that some of those do continue. But you really wonder if there's anybody who feels like he actually has the authority, who is actually empowered to commit the leader. Uh, by the way, that we go around this with our own government sometimes. I mean, I've worked, obviously, for Republican and Democratic administrations, for a variety of different folks around the, the president. And one of the questions was, you know, can the national security advisor commit the president? What I mean was, could he say, yep, let's do this, and I'll get, I'll get yes and he actually gets yes. Yeah. That's not always the case. Yeah. Uh, and it, that's very problematic. If it's not, I might add, because then you clearly just can't, you're, you're going to have to get the approval from the president. I wonder if there's anyone around him now, because if that person becomes too high profile and too threatening, yeah. still to this very young, uh, very brutal uh leader, then I think his, his life expectancy could be reduced considerably. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's, what, what's interesting is like, because 
you know, yeah, those of us who study North Korea spend a lot of time counting who's standing next to whom. Yep. <laughs> it's the old Kremlinology stuff. It's very yep. boring. Is, but, the, uh, is the sister in the photograph. Absolutely, right? Yeah. And whenever he goes on the spot meetings, there's usually a top military guy and a top economic advisor, which is one of the things, when we look at the pattern of his, of his leadership, number one, he's clearly been calling out his father's <clears throat> his father's uh, uh, supporters, Jiang Song Tek, the, and it's the, the husband of his aunt, you know, so it's, a, it's marriage, but not a blood relative, was very powerful, was in charge of the Chinese uh, 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 businesses, and so not, not just a powerful figure, but also in charge of a lot of money. I mean, there's reasons why he, he was, uh, you know, and what do they say, kill one to terrify thousands. I mean, that was a shot across the bow. Um, one of the things they do, though, when he goes everywhere, and he did this just at his uh, April 15 speech, at his New Year's speech was there's always to his right is one of the top military guys, and to his left is always a top economic guy. We tend to focus on the Byung-jin line, which says he cares about nuclear weapons. But it's very clear with his stuff about the, uh, uh, the shopping districts and the people who accompany him that to his people he's talking as much about the economy as well. So if there is leverage, to change it just a little bit slightly in another way, if there is leverage on the leadership it's that he has committed uh, North Korea in a way that his father didn't. His father said, if we have to suffer because we're fighting the Americans, that's fine. But Kim Jong-un has very clearly said, and he says this, and it's incredible. If you read his, his, his speeches to the North Korean people, he says, it breaks my heart. I can't sleep at night when I think of how hungry you are. Now, clearly, that's propaganda. But he's telling them something different. So can he actually do that and spend four or five years taking them down this path and then pull back? If there's leverage on the sanctions, that's, I think, where you change the expectations and then you can't deliver. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see how he's able to manage that. But just on the leadership things, yes, I mean, I see, I see a much more clear pattern of a young CEO who's, who's coming up with a vision and getting rid of old people and deciding who he, who's in his, um, who, who he can trust. And who has to be worried by defections, yeah. has to be worried by even though this is the hermit kingdom and the least connected place in the world, there still are ways of getting in, there are still ways of uh, exposing North Koreans to South Korean soap operas and these yeah. kinds of things. Uh, and they're gradually understanding that there is a bigger world out there uh, and they don't have access to it, which is of course what drives, say, the defector who, you know, he risked a hail of bullets to get to the south. Uh, and did survive, it appears, and has been watching uh, soaps yep. ever since, I think. <laughs> 24 hours a day. Or, or uh, K-pop. Yeah, no, K-pop. That and K-pop, right. yes. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I have lots more questions, but I'd like to make sure we can bring our students in. Um, do we have someone with a microphone, or do we have a microphone set up so that someone can, people can come and what's, how are we going to do this? Students? I know you're out there, yes. <laughs> That's even one of mine, yes. Uh, please, please just uh, introduce yourself and, and ask your question. Go ahead and stand up. If you could stand up, that'd be helpful. No problem. I'm Stephen Chester. I'm a international relations student at Ivy League. Uh, so I got a question. How do you feel Trump's sort of unilateral real credit uh, towards our response towards uh, North Korea affects our allies in Japan and South Korea and other places. Uh, and just if you guys could kind of touch on that. I, look, I think that he has a very good relationship with uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, Abe worked very hard to establish this, I think perhaps more than any other national leader. Uh, he immediately flew to New York uh, after the election, reported into Trump Tower, uh, Trump very pleased by that. Um, he uh, subsequently was the first to go to Mar-a-Lago, as I recall, for one of these Mar-a-Lago summits. Um, Trump has now been there. All of the other uh, senior members of the administration, uh, defense, state, vice president, et cetera, have all uh, gone through Tokyo. And that relationship is very, very strong. I've actually been, I was in Japan twice in, I think it was October alone. I uh, once was, by the way, with, with uh, President Nikias and a team from USC uh, and, and met with the National Security Advisor and Minister of Foreign Affairs and these others. Uh, and 
frankly, there is a very, very strong relationship, not just at the top, but then between the national security advisors, between the ministers of foreign affairs, between the ministers of defense, uh, et cetera. So I just think that is a very, very strong relationship right now. Uh, and again, it starts at the very top with a relationship between the two leaders that I think is, is, is very, very solid. Different in South Korea, of course, because they had the election. You had uh, the previous uh, president departed, uh, as you know, uh, and the new president, if you will, still, uh, President Moon, came in intending to return to a bit of the so-called sunshine policy where you're a bit more positive uh, in your uh, relationship with North Korea. Frankly, that didn't survive very long because of the repeated tests uh, that were very alarming to the people of South Korea uh, and obviously to their newly elected president. Once again, though, a good relationship building, I think, and um, just not the same duration yet and, and not quite the same uh, uh, personal warmth, but again, very, very close between the respective ministers and the, and, and also, by the way, with the US military, needless to say, given that it's a US Army four star who is the commander of the so-called UN command and the combined forces uh, command uh, and would command all forces on the peninsula, mostly Korean and US, of course, uh, in the event of some kind of conflict. Uh, so again, very good relationship. There is, in fact, uh, there are specific relations between uh, the US and uh, the Korean military and defense and state uh, that also, there, it's really institutionalized in a way because of the commitment that we have made, because of the alliance relationship that we have uh, with South Korea. So I think, again, those relationships are quite strong. I don't think that they are concerned the way some perhaps in Western Europe or some other parts of the world might be concerned uh, that the United States is demonstrating a bit of ambivalence about whether or not to lead, to continue to lead the so-called rules-based international order. Uh, and to promote the traditional values, freedoms, democracy, and so forth. Uh, I think there's a bit more of that in, in some other countries where you don't have the same kind of threat uh, that you have from North Korea that tends to push those other issues uh, to the side. Did, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a great question. And I would make a, a, one, one comment, which is if we look out five years from now, right, if we can avoid the miscalculation, which I think there's a very good chance we can, right? What, what, what will the world look like five years from now? Even if North Korea doesn't, I, I, and again, I think it's sort of a, uh, uh, a unicorn to hope that they just denuclearize and, and give up, right? But we might have a nuclear-armed North Korea, but it'll be much poorer and much more isolated than it is today. At the same time, five years from now, Japan and Korea are cooperating more than we've ever seen in the past because of the North Korean threat which has always been a problem with U.S., Japan, U.S., Korea. In other words, it, things may come in a way that provide the United States and its allies uh, much better cooperation and a much better position. Uh, one of the big questions would be how China reacts to much more enhanced, mil a much stronger South Korea and much stronger Japan. Uh, so in some ways there could be a very uh, positive outcome in a way, even if we're not able to solve the North Korea problem. And, and of course, you have to, I think, give credit to Japan and to Abenomics uh, for now that, again, I guess it was the most recent quarter. Again, you've seen something that hasn't been achieved since, I think, the 1980s or 90s, which is uh, the number of quarters of positive uh, GDP growth. Uh, just unprecedented after a, two decades of basically in the doldrums. So. You do see uh, Japan uh, moving very effectively in, in that regard as well. And it's, you know, truth in lending, again, as you mentioned, the chairman of the KKR Global Institute, KKR is one of the world's biggest investment firms, and I'm a partner there as well. I mean, we've done an enormous amount of investment in Japan mm -hmm. and see it as a place where we want to do literally $3 billion of the $9.3 billion we just raised for Asia uh, there. So that talks, yeah. that's, that is significant. Uh, and um, so we see uh, Japan as really in a bit of a comeback now uh, economically. D 
despite a demographic downturn that could turn into a death spiral. I mean, it's going to be the one country in the world where the rise of the robots will be actually welcomed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if we can, we have time for a few more questions. You want to um, right here. take one here on the front? Sure. And then just give it to the one in front of you. Yeah. My name is Anishka. I'm a freshman major in international relations and economics. I also take Professor Yeah. Uh, my question was, given the sort of relationship we have with North Korea at the moment, where the value of maintaining peace and not having active combat or conflict is, is high, and the value of striking first is low, do you perceive the latter variable changing in the, in, in the future? Or do you think it's more or less going to remain constant? It's about the first step. Why don't I start, just, and then I'll just hand, hand off to uh, Professor Kahn. Um, let me just compliment you on your choice of majors, because I think the combination of international relations and economics is, is brilliant. I think one without the other uh, is inadequate. Uh, the two together, I think, are hugely important to understanding the world and, and to having the kinds of thought processes, the analytical framework, uh, that comes from understanding comparative uh, politics and, and again, comparative economic systems <coughs> in, in particular. And for what it's worth, I think that it's actually time to bring back the study of, uh, of comparative politics, which went away, as you know, in sure. you know, 1990, 91, when the wall came down, Soviet Union dissolved, we won the Gulf War, we had the end of history, as Frank Fukuyama wrote in his essay, you know, the, the dialectic between these different forms, uh, it's over, and we won, uh, and our system prevailed. And I think you have to be um, honest, intellectually honest, and acknowledge that there is another system that has achieved more than any other system in the history of the world, and this is China, because it did two decades of double-digit GDP growth uh, year on year, with maybe one exception, something, again, no other country has ever achieved uh, in, in history. And we have to be aware how attractive that system may appear to others, particularly those that are given to authoritarian um, uh, tendencies, um, and, <coughs> and then look at our own system, of course, and, and do some comparison, and you know what can one learn from the other? And I'm not by any means diminishing the, uh, some of the the obvious uh, criticisms that can be leveled about loss or lack of certain freedoms, certain uh, uh, areas in the rule of law and so on. But with that, actually, let me hand off back okay. to you. No, I think, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you said it because I tell them all they should take as much economics as That's they can stomach. That's why I said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's good for you. It's your vegetables. Um, Although some people like to study it, Roger. But uh, no, so, you know, the thing is, the question would be like, when would, it, is there something that could happen that would change the calculus so that we think that somebody, either us or them, think that they can shoot first and get away with it? And I don't see what could possibly happen in the short to medium term, you know, five, 10 years, possibly, where we would think that they are so degraded that they won't respond, or that they would think that they can attack us uh, and we won't respond. So I think that the, in, in many ways, the basic deterrence calculus is going to stay the same for it until something radically changes, which would be, who knows, you know, some kind of internal chaos or something like that. But I don't know anything else that could change it. I, let me just interject what I do fear, uh, and that is that North Korea gets so desperate, in a sense, yeah. that Kim Jong-un realizes this thing is just not working. Uh, I don't want to open up to the kinds of systems and so forth that could really spur uh, economic growth, um, maybe we just create a crisis. You know, this is the Korean, North Korean version of wag the dog or something. Let, let's just start a war and get people's minds off things. Uh, I am a bit worried about that. Uh, so I think this is, and China's very worried about that. Yeah. I mean, China's concern, again, is not to bring him to his knees. Yeah. Uh, how do you calibrate this enough to bring him to the table, uh, but not bring about the collapse of the regime in North Korea? When you're truly desperate, yeah. Yeah. So, so it seems a little bit contrary to what you've said that it's really very much response. Do you, Do you think that's that's something that could happen? The o or you mean like this, right? Yeah. I mean, the the only way that I think that that North Korea would strike first is if we do squeeze him into a corner far enough that they have one choice, and that's they're either going to die slowly or give it a shot. 
Yep. Right. And so I think a lot of American policy has traditionally been aimed at squeezing and threatening, but not making that choice too stark. And that's clearly what the Chinese do. Chinese sort of like stability and they'd like denuclearization, but they value stability more than denuclearization. <laughs> and it's, you know, for them to really squeeze, they're going to have to switch those priorities. And, you know, I think they're, they're not, they're clearly not happy with North Korea right now. So they're going to squeeze, but I'm not sure they would ever squeeze as hard to really risk what might happen. Um, right here. Over there in the back. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Thank you both for coming and attending and everything. Um, so I feel like something that we're kind of not talking about and that we don't really see a lot in like news coverage and everything is kind of the context of this. You know, we talk about it as if these things just started in the past like, years without any like historical how did we get here. And I feel like this is something we can't talk about in this sources. So just like some context. This is kind of a big question, but I'll keep it uh, limited, please. So, uh, you know, when you look back at the record, there's going to be 1,054 U.S. nuclear tests, um, 7,000 nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Uh, we left out the Korean War, which is like a pretty big deal, uh, where 3 million Koreans died and, you know, literally the entire North was leveled, something that the U.S. pilot like actually joked about and like, bragged about the way. Um, we left out like the very, very brutal U.S. occupation of the South, which um, included things like massacring hundreds of thousands of boy jailing them, you know, Korean, actual Korean citizens. The U.S. government played a role in doing that. A uh, couple things, and then lastly, the 70,000 troops that are across the sea, the U.S. troops that are across the area. I'm not sure how many North Korean troops are across the rest of the world. Uh, I think it's about zero, but something like that. And then, you know, 45,000 in Japan, 24,000 in South Korea, that's like sort of like directly on their border. Uh, last thing is that we left out 6,000 bombs have been dropped by one country on seven different countries in 2017 alone. Meanwhile, I mean, I, I'll let the people guess which country that was because it wasn't the one Paul wanted to guess. So, Basically, the DPRK has consistently said that in the case of the U.S. signing a peace treaty and also um, just like stopping military strike by these drills that are right on the borders and stuff, they will denuclearize. So I guess the final question is, it seems that we kind of beg the question here. And the question I'm asking is, is the impetus for denuclearization not only the largest nuclear power in the world with 800 bases in seven different countries, the only country to ever use nuclear weapons on a civilian population. Thank you for the question. We have five more minutes, so I'm going to let each of our panelists um, respond to that and, and um, see if they want to add one final thought. Um, why don't we start with General Petraeus? Well, there's certainly elements of what you've described, I think, that are absolutely correct. Um, I'd perhaps note that the Korean War that you rightly described as doing enormous damage not just to the North, but the South as well. Uh, let's remember that the South is almost pushed all the way out uh, of the, uh, what was it, the Busan, Busan perimeter. Yeah. Um, that was begun by North Korea. Um, so the aggressor in that case very clearly and indisputably was not the side that we were supporting, but the North. I think the Koreans would be the first, South Koreans would be the first to note uh, that there have been some uh, episodes in their history, including even their recent history, um, where uh, various freedoms were abridged, um, corruption uh, was uh, severe. I mean, presidents have been jailed. Uh, the most recent intel chiefs are all, I think, I think both of the, my counterparts, yes. um, because of domestic spying uh, in support of one political party. So again, I don't think anybody in any way is shrinking from any of this at all. Um, and I think the facts that you've laid out are, m many of the facts that you laid out are, are, are accurate. Um, I don't subscribe at all, though, to the idea that if we stopped our exercises that they would uh, stop their testing or denuclearize. I think uh, their word has not proven to be their bond repeatedly. 
that made promise after promise. We've had deal after deal, and they have ultimately broken every single one of those. Uh, and I think that we held up our side on those deals. So again, I'd offer that as part of the context as well. Thank you. Um, Professor Conn. I, I also, look, I'm sort of also unabashedly, uh, I think, pro-American at the end of the day. And uh, I think there's no comparison whatsoever uh, between life under, quote, our system and, say, life under Kim Jong-un. Um, if one sees that as admirable or defensible or something like that, I think that's, uh, that would I'd very much wonder about the logic behind that. I'll let you have the final word. <laughs> wow, thank you. Um, no, I think it's a great question, right? I mean, there, there's clearly, there is, there is a, tr you know, to go back and, and find out how this actually started goes to a division of the peninsula in the first place by the great powers, to Japanese imperialism that started a war, to Western imperialism that caused Japan to respond. I mean, there's, there's some horrible things that have gone on. There's no question about it. Uh, where we are today is, what do we do about a country that is basically uh, treats its citizens horribly, that has a, a massive military and a, and a nuclear weapons program, that I know people in the administration, this one and the last one, who are willing to sit down and try and talk to the North Koreans. And I am the one who wants to engage. That's my, my, my entire thing is, I think the more information we get into North Korea is better. The more interactions they have is better. And yet, this is a country that doesn't in many ways want to play along. And so the question is, what do we do today about it? And how do we actually resolve this? Um, and in many ways, I think we're, we're back to the same kinds of questions we had before. How much, how much pressure is going to work and how much inducements are going to work? I tend to come down more on the opening of the society and the opening of the economy. And the, the way I will leave it with two things, because I think this might, might be more interesting. Number one, I don't think North Korea is a problem to be solved. I think it's a country we have to live with. We've been hoping it would collapse and go away. Uh, but it's a country that we have to, li I can't imagine any combination of sanctions and pressure and, and, and engagement or whatever that will get it to denuclearize, uh, treat its citizens re with dignity and open up the, I can't imagine that all happening. So we have to live with it in some way and we want to try and minimize the threat and then hopefully move forward with the people because the people are the biggest victims of the regime. So is there a way that we can help the people of the regime, of the country, uh, while trying to get the regime to change? And that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and I think in some ways we are, hopefully we're moving in a position that's forward where, you know, to, to our set of policies that will, that will move us a little bit forward, move that needle a little bit. Um. Good, well, thank you all for coming. Let's give our two panelists a round of applause. <laughs>